Hello, I'm Dr. Anthony Lang from the University of Toronto. And today I'm going to cover the diagnosis of multiple system atrophy and particularly how this has evolved over the years and where we are now. These are my disclosures. Uh, I'm advising a number of companies, some of which fortunately are interested in developing therapeutics for multiple system atrophy. As the audience may know, multiple system atrophy is one of the neurodegenerative conditions we now call a synucleinopathy. Uh, the four commonest group uh, of synucleinopathies uh, include Parkinson's disease, the most common, dementia with Lewy bodies, a condition called pure autonomic failure, and then multiple system atrophy. There are a number of other disorders that have uh, Lewy bodies, an uh, inclusion body that contains the protein alpha-synuclein. Alpha-synuclein is a normal protein, and you can see on the right side of this uh, slide that it is involved in synaptic function, the way that nerve cells talk to each other. And at the end of the uh, long axon, there are synapses, and this protein is involved in the storage and release and reuptake of neurotransmitters uh, from the synapse. Multiple system atrophy has a long history. Um, in fact, the term was coined in 1969, but it was well recognized long before that. Graham and Oppenheimer recognized that a group of disorders had uh, similarities and the previous terms that had been applied were olivopontocerebellar atrophy, uh, idiopathic orthostatic hypotension, meaning a drop in blood pressure when the patient stands up, or progressive autonomic failure, Shai Drager syndrome, based on the description of a disorder by two doctors, Shai and Drager, and then finally, striatonigral degeneration. In 1989, uh, Pap and his colleagues recognized a feature under the microscope glyocytoplasmic inclusions, or GCIs, that confirmed Graham and Oppenheimer's belief that multiple system atrophy and all of these disorders uh, were in fact the same condition. And then in 1998, the protein that I've mentioned, alpha-synuclein, was recognized as a hallmark. This is a relatively uncommon disorder. Uh, its prevalence is 1.9 uh, to 4.4 per 100,000 in the population. Um, the annual incidence is 0.6 cases per 100,000 persons, or three per 100,000 people over the age of 50. We don't know the cause. Uh, there have been hypotheses that it could be related to exposures to in, in occupations, for example, to organic solvents, to plastic monomers and additives, pesticides, uh, working in agriculture, uh, there is an inverse association with smoking, as in Parkinson's, but not as strong. There's very little evidence of a genetic risk. I'll mention this uh, later, although in Japan, um, multiple system atrophy of the cerebellar type that we're going to talk about in a minute is far more common than the Parkinson type. And this might suggest some form of genetic risk or predisposition in uh, Asians, particularly in Japanese. The clinical features really now we recognize are dominated by three major features, Parkinsonism, ataxia, and autonomic dysfunction. Parkinsonism is the clinical syndrome that is seen most often in Parkinson's disease, slowness, bradykinesia, rigidity or stiffness in muscles, the tendency to fall, sometimes a tremor at rest as in Parkinson's disease, most, but most often uh, rest tremor of Parkinson's is not very common in multiple system atrophy. Instead, patients demonstrate a more jerky kind of tremor when they use the limbs in about 50%. And this jerkiness is often termed myoclonus. Ataxia is another motor condition or a motor disorder where there is clumsiness and uh, disturbances of uh, the limb, of um, the, the limbs, I should say, in using the arms and the legs, uh, gait, uh, walking, as well as uh, eye movement uh, features. Finally, autonomic dysfunction refers to a disturbance of what we call the autonomic nervous system. Uh, this is the uh, automatic nervous system that controls things like blood pressure, bladder, 
uh, bowels, sexual function. And this is a very common feature and is a hallmark and is uh, often severe and early with um, drop in blood pressure, with fainting, uh, with urinary incontinence and retention. And that is the uh, hallmark that makes the diagnosis of the condition. But we'll talk about the delays in uh, diagnosis in a minute. These are cartoons that show a section of the brain across uh, from the side. So if we cut the, the head in half and uh, show the, uh, the brain from the side, the cortex is the top part, the brain stem sits out in front, and this back part here is the cerebellum. Um, and so in the multiple system atrophy Parkinson features, or MSAP, this is the old term striatal nigral degeneration. The striatum, the, what are called the basal ganglia and the substantia nigra, the dopamine area of the brain are predominantly affected. And that's why Parkinsonism uh, is the predominant manifestation. The next uh, um, cartoon over is multiple system atrophy of the cerebellar type, MSAC. Olivopontal cerebellar atrophy is the old term. And that's where the back part of the brain, the cerebellum and the part of the brainstem called the pons is particularly involved. And that re uh, results in ataxia, the clumsiness, uh, often uh, significant walking problems and uh, speech and other features. And then the autonomic nervous system, as I've mentioned, is involved and then multiple uh, regions of the brain and the brain stem account for the autonomic failure. This is another slide now showing cutting through the a brain from the front to the back and through the brain stem um, in what we call axial slices. And uh, you see the various different regions that are marked in black that are involved. So this is why we call it multiple system atrophy. Many different regions of the brain and the brain stem are involved. Under the microscope, we see loss of nerve cells and what we call gliosis or sort of scarring of the, um, the brain and also accumulation of iron. So these are features that are very characteristic under the microscope. And as I've mentioned, um, uh, Pap and his colleagues recognized and described the inclusions, uh, the oligodendroglial inclusions or glial cytoplasmic cytoplasmic inclusions. And the oligodendroglial cells are supporting cells of the, uh, the brain. And these are very much involved in the formation of myelin, which coats the axons and allows faster conduction of electrical current across nerve cells. And these inclusions are in these um, oligodendroglial cells. And then, as I've mentioned, the protein alpha-synuclein was recognized, and when we stain with antibodies against alpha-synuclein, you see at the bottom a uh, tremendous um, ability to show these changes, whereas in the absence of that staining, the top part of this slide, you don't see much abnormality. So let's, in addition to the Parkinsonism, the ataxia, and the autonomic failure, we see other features that allow us to characterize the disorder, and these are very important in making a diagnosis. So breathing problems, obstructive sleep apnea or OSA, and inspiratory sighing, or another feature is strider. And I want you to listen to the strider features. And those features uh, are secondary to the vocal cords coming together, tightening when the patient is breathing in. And that is a, an important clue to the diagnosis. Bulbar dysfunction, this next line refers to difficulties with swallowing and speech. So severe difficulties with um, uh, speech and tightening of the vocal cords, as I've mentioned, not only interfering with breathing, but with speaking. Um, Swallowing difficulties called dysphagia and slurring of speech called dysarthria. Abnormal postures are not uncommon as well. And uh, I'm going to show you some features, the pictures that you're seeing here. The Pisa syndrome refers to deviation 
to one side, like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. In the middle of this slide is the forward flexion of the neck, so-called anticollis, which is uh, predominant in some patients. And then others have very severe flexion of the trunk, so-called camptocarmia. Other features, um, what are called emotional incontinence, crying or laughter inappropriately that the patient has little control over, increased deep tendon reflexes, cold hands and cold feet shown on the uh, slide here that results in mottling of the skin, and then something called rapid eye movement behavior disorder. And I want you to watch the videotape of this patient. So you see that individual is asleep and during rapid eye movement sleep, when he's dreaming, he enacts his dreams. Uh, in normal individuals, we lose muscle tone during rapid eye movement sleep to protect us. So we're not activating our muscles. Whereas here, the brainstem mechanisms of preventing um, activation of muscles is lost. And so patients are able to act out their dreams. And you can see this can be dangerous to the patient. They may fall out of bed, they may injure themselves, or they may injure their, their bed partner. And this is a, a feature that may actually precede other manifestations of uh, multiple system atrophy. It's a feature also that we see in Parkinson's disease and um, uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, two other synuclein uh, degenerative conditions. We also think of features that are against the diagnosis, a late onset after the age of 75. I've mentioned the kind of tremor that we see in Parkinson's disease at rest that is not a, typically a feature of multiple system atrophy. Loss of function of peripheral nerves, so-called neuropathy is not seen in MSA. Hallucinations and dementia and a family history are all features that were generally not seen in uh, this condition. As I mentioned, this is a disorder that generally occurs younger than um, Parkinson's disease and other conditions that mimic Parkinson's. So it's a disorder that starts in the, the mid 50s most often and rarely uh, in the 70s and 80s. Um, typically the intervals from onset to needing a walking aid are about three years, needing a wheelchair about five years, being bedridden eight and deaf about nine to 10 years. Uh, so this is a, a bad disease that causes severe physical disability and uh, results in death uh, prematurely, unfortunately. This is a slide that looks at milestones of disease. The top bar that you see in the middle is Parkinson's. Uh, the bottom line you see is the age of onset. So um, if we look at the top gray bar, Parkinson's generally begins in the late 50s, early 60s, and extends over many years. You see here the bar ending around the age of 76 or 77, uh, so maybe 20 years in some patients or more, um, with things like falling, uh, cognitive difficulties, needing residential care occurring in the later part of the disease, so many years that the patient suffers from the condition without those problems. The middle bar is another neurodegenerative disorder that mimics these two, progressive supranuclear palsy. You see the gray bar is much shorter. The patient develops the condition in the mid 60s, mid to late 60s. And unfortunately that condition lasts about 10 years or so with the earlier development of falling, cognitive difficulties, um, Re requiring residential care, res uh, wheelchair dependency, et cetera. In contrast, the bottom gray bar is multiple system atrophy, as I've mentioned, beginning in the mid to late 50s and surviving again about nine to 10 years. A diagnosis generally about the same duration of time as Parkinson's disease, 
Again, we're talking about diagnosis in a minute. With many of these complications, the falling, um, urinary catheter, uh, residential care all occurring uh, later in the condition. On the far left of the slide, you see if you have early autonomic dysfunction, you tend to have a shorter course. So the faster the line declines downward, it means the faster the uh, uh, time the condition progresses and the shorter interval to death. So a later development of these autonomic disturbances, the bowel, the bladder, the blood pressure, the longer the patient lives. And the bottom uh, graph shows you that the earlier the onset, under the age of 50, for example, the slope uh, and the speed of progression is slower. And so the later onset, the shorter the course, the earlier the onset, potentially the longer the course. This is a, uh, an evaluation of 100 patients with probable MSA, and you can see that the autonomic failure and Parkinsonism is present in over 90%. The ataxia and cerebellar feature is about 50%, but remember that I told you that in Japan, the cerebellar features are far more common. Pyramidal features include things like um, uh, brisk reflexes and uh, what, what's called spasticity, and these are variable as well. So in the uh, North American and Caucasian populations, multiple system atrophy of the Parkinson's subtype predominates. And as I've mentioned, uh, Asians, Japanese, the cerebellar type is more common. So this 80 to 20 is more uh, Caucasian. And it's been suggested that the Parkinson uh, phenotype survives uh, shorter or has a, um, a shorter survival than in the cerebellar phenotype. Unfortunately, treatment is very difficult in this condition. Um, if you have Parkinsonism, we will see a response to levodopa, the treatment that's most often used in Parkinson's disease. And so in the early stages, we may see a very a useful response from this drug, but it is often diminished or lost with time. And uh, some patients develop what's called dystonia or abnormal movements and contractions of facial muscles as a response to the levodopa. Um, we treat the autonomic failure, particularly the um, orthostatic hypotension, the drop in blood pressure when standing and the resulting faints. We treat that with a variety of drugs and the respiratory problems. Remember I um, showed you the, um, or we played the um, sound of stridor. Uh, that may require treatment with something called uh, continuous positive airway pressure or CPAP. Um, as I've mentioned, the prognosis of this condition is not uh, very good and uh, unfortunately results in a mean survival of about uh, five to 10 years. So let's uh, finish this lecture, uh, the remaining part of the lecture and concentrate on how we make the diagnosis and how we've done that over the years. A very important uh, landmark was 1999's a publication of this first consensus statement on the diagnosis of multiple system atrophy. And this recognized those domains that I've mentioned already, autonomic failure, Parkinsonism, cerebellar, and uh, we emphasized the corticospinal tract, but that was not an important component of the diagnosis. We highlighted the exclusion criteria, so for example, if the patient had had a brain infection or had uh, a brain tumor or some other insult that was very clear on history, uh, that would exclude um, multiple system atrophy. The physical examination, if remember I mentioned a per bad peripheral neuropathy would be an exclusionary criteria as well. And then a variety of laboratory features that excluded the diagnosis. And we categorized MSA at that time under definite if the pathology was obtained. So unfortunately, definite MSA could only be made, the diagnosis could only be made at postmortem after the patient had died with the characteristic features that I've shown you. Probable MSA fulfilled specific criteria that were developed by this committee uh, that evaluated the disease. And then we had a possible category where certain criteria were added up to allow us to come to that conclusion. 
And you see in this possible um, poor levodopa response was characteristic, and I'll come to that in a minute. Then in 2008, about nine years later, um, the group again got together, recognizing that things had uh, changed or our understanding of the disease had evolved. And there was a second consensus statement published in a journal called Neurology in 2008. And we established specific criteria for the diagnosis. So this is what we call a sporadic rather than a genetic disease beginning over the age of 30 with progressive features, again, with autonomic failure, Parkinsonism, poorly responsive to levodopa. So that was emphasized. And then the ataxia features. That was a criteria for probable. We had different criteria for possible. We won't go through these. It's not that important right now to uh, go through them because things are evolving. But we had possible, probable. Again, a definite MSA was a diagnosis at autopsy. And what was um, a bit more definitive in these diagnostic criteria is that we had additional features. And you can just scan this for possible MSA C or P, possible MSA P, possible MSA C with varying different features. So additional features that supported the diagnosis of possible, and then features that were called red flags that supported or didn't support, supporting features and features that were against the diagnosis. And so we would add up all of these features and come to a conclusion as to whether the uh, diagnosis was uh, supportive of possible or probable. One of the features that uh, was highlighted in these, the second consensus was uh, neuroimaging criteria. And this is uh, MRI scanning. And the two classical features on the MRI scan are features in the back part of the brain, the cerebellum and the brain stem in the MSAC variant. And so you see here this cross in the middle of the brainstem part called the pons. And this was very similar to the buns that are called hot cross buns. So this is the hot cross bun sign. And there were other features, high signal, this little bright signal in this area of the uh, brainstem called the middle cerebellar peduncle. So those two features were considered hallmarks. And then features in the basal ganglia that are outlined by these arrows. The, this region of the basal ganglia is the striatum. And we see shrinkage of the striatum. We see this bright little white signal that is abnormal. And the dark black signal is indicative of iron deposition. And so these features were highlighted as hallmarks of the cerebellar form of, uh, of multiple system atrophy or the Parkinsonian form of multiple system atrophy. But despite these better diagnostic criteria and the addition of now some imaging features that supported the diagnosis in two studies, one from the Mayo Clinic and the other from Queen Square in London, England, when patients were followed to death and studied at autopsy, you see the sensitivity at the first clinic visit being rather low. So this is the new consensus for possible MSA or the new consensus criteria for probable MSA being 41% or 18% respectively. So this is far lower than we would ever have hoped. Uh, you see from the bottom part of this table that the diagnosis gets better at the last clinic visit. But as I'll emphasize, it's really important to be making a correct diagnosis at the first clinic visit, at the earliest stages. And so these criteria le still leave a lot to be desired. And so a group of us got together and reviewed the sense second consensus criteria and created a critique. We uh, established a questionnaire 20 members of the Movement Disorder Society evaluated this. And so we published this uh, a couple of years ago. And then this created the uh, development of the Movement Disorder Society uh, new MSA diagnostic criteria uh, study group. And so we evaluated a variety of issues that are highlighted in this slide, the problems with diagnostic accuracy, the variability of the clinical features, the tremendous variability of levodopa response. Remember I said that it was poor 
even in the second uh, consensus criteria, but we now recognize a proportion of patients have a very good levodopa response initially. And then there were non-supporting and exclusion criteria, some family history, and as I mentioned in the Asian patients, some suggestion of genetic factors, and then the role of diagnostic tests. So the Movement Disorder Society created a study group to begin to look at these criteria and develop new criteria. We reviewed the literature. We had what are called Delphi methods going through two rounds of consensus uh, criteria, Delphi methods. We conducted an open survey of the Movement Disorder Society and then uh, met with a consensus conference. And uh, the next few slides I'll quickly go through. Um, the purpose of this was for transparency, to apply multidisciplinary approaches to the diagnosis and hopefully develop reliable diagnostic criteria. And Again, this will be very quick for screening. The whole process began in August 2018 uh, with the assignment of the task force. We met in Hong Kong at the meeting of the Movement Disorder Society in October uh, 2018 and assigned the working groups. You see the names of the oversight committee members here. There were a large number of people involved in this project with chairs, members, consultants, a group of neuropathologists, and then a junior executive team that reviewed all of the literature. These were the different working groups that were established. So you can see every aspect of this condition was considered with a working group, with a leader and members of the different working groups. And then, so we continued with a question and answer approach in December of 18, worked through the year of 2019 and then met in Nice in 2019 to review the state that we were in at that point, uh, following a literature review and an assessment of all of the uh, structure of the new criteria. Um, then into 2020, we established a first version. Uh, again, remember we're now into version three, uh, following the consensus, the second consensus criteria. We went through a Delphi assessment in uh, early 2020. And then again, through 2020, going through a second Delphi approach, evaluating each and every one of the criteria that were uh, established through all of the literature review. And now with a version 4.1 in late 2020, we went to, to a survey of the Movement Disorder Society in early 2021. In March, 2021, we had uh, a version 4.3, uh, following the survey. And then finally, very recently, uh, earlier this year, we had a consensus conference, a virtual consensus conference. And so the structure of the criteria that we've now established, uh, version four, has um, an established neuropathological neuropathologi version of MSA, like the earlier criteria, a clinically established MSA, clinically probable MSA. We no longer have a possible MSA version. And then the possible prodromal MSA. I can't share the criteria with you because these are under final review and a need to be published before they can be shared publicly, but I'll just share the uh, general outline of the criteria as they stand now, as I've mentioned, the established is neuropathological, um, clinically established, a new version. So we feel much stronger about the diagnosis and the purpose of the clinically established MSA is um, for clinical practice as well as for research. Clinically probable, the purpose is to include people in clinical trials and epidemiological and prognostic studies. And then finally, a new uh, form, uh, the ability to consider patients as having possible early prodromal MSA uh, for studies of the natural history and epidemiology. This is largely based on the presence of autonomic failure and minimal motor criteria that don't fulfill the criteria of the others. Now, one of the problems still is that even with these new criteria, I'm not sure they're going to be reliably distinguishing MSA at the very earliest stages. The clinically established and clinically probable MSA, there's still considerable overlap 
with other disorders early on like Parkinson's disease and progressive supranuclear palsy. So we still need more reliable separation. And then the fourth uh, form, the prodromal MSA, as I've mentioned, exclusively deals with patients with autonomic features or rapid eye movement behavior disorder. What we need, however, is to move the diagnosis earlier. And so we need probably with different approaches, with biomarkers, the ability to diagnose the condition even before patients fulfill the criteria that the, all the best of efforts uh, with the Movement Disorder Society's uh, uh, process have come up with. And I think that we're only gonna be doing, able to do that uh, with uh, new diagnostic tests. And we need this because we need to uh, introduce disease modifying therapies far earlier than we're capable of doing with clinical criteria. And so what are the possible biomarkers that we might be able to use for the early diagnosis? And you can scan this slide, um, genetic studies, but there are no reliable genetic uh, uh, predispositions that uh, we understand now. There are newer imaging studies that might be useful, but none of them have been applied yet and proven to allow us to make a diagnosis early. Maybe tissue biopsies, looking at the presence of alpha-synuclein with immunologic uh, approaches. However, um, at least the studies that have been done so far really don't lend themselves to reproducibility. And then maybe blood and cerebrospinal uh, markers. There's a, a protein called neurofilament light chain that is increased in MSA, but it's rather nonspecific uh, and is also increased in progressive supranuclear palsy or even conditions like multiple sclerosis. So finally, additional um, markers might be these uh, novel techniques called seeding assays, the real-time quaking-induced conversion at the bottom here, RT-quick, or protein misfolding cyclic ampl amplification or PMCA, which uh, take advantage of the fact that the abnormal synuclein, the abnormal protein, is capable of inducing abnormal folding in the normal form of the protein. So the presence of abnormal protein is detected by its ability to seed and change normal alpha-synuclein. And so there are a number of studies here summarized in this slide uh, that demonstrate that in the cerebrospinal fluid of patients with Parkinson's and also in multiple system atrophy, we can find the presence of the abnormal protein using these techniques. The uh, figure at the bottom right here shows the abnormality in Parkinson's, but in this study, they didn't find an abnormality in MSA, whereas uh, selected studies have now shown MSA can be abnormal as well. And it's also possible to demonstrate these seeding assays in patients who have the very earliest manifestations of these conditions. So isolated rapid eye movement behavior disorder, I defined that for you earlier. So these are patients that don't demonstrate any motor features apart from the sleep abnormalities. And then on the right of the side, patients with a pure form of autonomic failure who later, so they present with, uh, for example, drop in blood pressure when they stand orthostatic hypotension, but only later evolve to manifest multiple system atrophy or uh, Parkinson's. And you can see in the earliest stages when they only have autonomic failure, they can demonstrate the presence of the abnormal seeding. And also this abnormal seeding can be demonstrated in skin. So not just cerebrospinal fluid, but there have been preliminary studies to show that the abnormal seeding can be discovered in skin, at least in Parkinson's disease. So far, MSA hasn't been very successfully studied in this way. And so I'll just mention that my group, uh, working with an excellent biochemist uh, listed as the first author, Ivan Martinez Balbuena, and uh, my colleague, Dr. Gabor Kovacs, and myself and others, have now applied a novel method of using the real-time quaking-induced conversion assay in punched skin biopsies, simple punched skin biopsies, and then combine that with this nonspecific abnormality in neurofilament light chain that I mentioned earlier. And we've discovered that we can 
fairly reliably demonstrate abnormalities both in Parkinson's disease and in multiple system atrophy. And then the elevation of neurofilament light chain tells us that the patient more likely has multiple system atrophy than Parkinson's disease. And so if our work and others can be confirmed in larger numbers, I'm hoping that we're going to move the dial back and we'll be able to evaluate patients at the very, very earliest stages. For example, when they have rapid eye movement behavior disorder or when they have just uh, autonomic disturbances and be able to diagnose them before they get on this horrible curve of progressive disease that only lives for five or, or um, more years. And uh, so at that point, we can introduce disease modifying therapy when it becomes available and hopefully prevent this terrible course. So I'll thank you for your attention and we'll entertain questions uh, after the, the lecture.